Hi, everyone. Welcome to a Jewish conversation for Pride Month. I'm Jody Rujora, and I'm the editor in chief of The Forward. Very excited to have you uh, with us today, the last day of Pride Month. We thought it would be a great way to end. Uh, the celebration, observation, questioning that people may have been having this month with so much going on in the world. Um, we wanted to really bring the focus to the LGBTQ community. Um, and we're asking uh, our wonderful panelists to talk about how far we've come and what happens next. Um, we are thrilled to have you with us. I'm sort of giving everybody an opportunity to get in the Zoom. Um, I want to just give you a few programming notes before I introduce our great uh, guests. Um, we are gonna to be together for about an hour. We would love to be able to have some of you ask questions of our panelists or put questions that I can ask to them. If you wanna do that, you should use the Q&A button, which if you're on a computer will be on the bottom of your screen. I think on a phone, it's on the left. Don't put questions into the chat. The chat is a good place to share any comments or thoughts with the whole group. Um, if you put questions into the chat, I will probably not see them and not be able to find them and not be able to ask them. Um, don't worry if you miss a link or something that gets put in the chat, we will email you everything from the chat, all of the resources that we share uh, during this conversation. We will email you along with a video um, of the conversation, which you can, um, which you can then share. I see that Jackie Benson has um, just said hello to one of our great panelists, Arya. He, she, uh, Jackie is in Cape Town, South Africa. Feel free to give us shout outs on the chat um, if you know one of our panelists um, or you just want to say where you are, um, what you, who you are, where you are, what you might be doing to celebrate the last day of Pride uh, today besides coming to this conversation. I am going to start now by, um, I want to just, one more thing, thank Lisa Lepson, who's hosting this conversation for us on Zoom, Gabby Brooks and Dina Cooperman, who helped put it together, um, and let you know also that in your email, you also get a special discounted subscription offer for The Forward. We'd love to keep you in our family and make sure you know about all of our future Zoom events as well as our coverage. So I'm um, just going to start by introducing the panel and then we'll just jump right in to some questions. We've got with us today Rabbi Deborah Waxman, who is the president of Reconstruction, Reconstructing Judaism, the central organization of the Reconstructionist movement. Um, she's been leading that for I think seven years, is that right? Um, and is the first woman and the first out queer person to head a major denominational organization. Um, we also have with us Arthur Slepian um, call, from San Francisco. He is the new board chairman of the Federation out there. He's also the founder of A Wider Bridge, which is a really important uh, nonprofit that works to build um, connections and support between the LGBTQ people and allies in Israel and North America. Um, and he was has also been a long time active member and past president of Congregation Sha'ar Zahav, which is one of the LGBTQ focused uh, congregations in America. And one of the things we're gonna talk about is whether there continues to be a need or a role for such congregations in the kind of broader um, congregational map. We also have from, uh, not from, calling in from Zion National Park where he is on vacation, Arya Marvazi, the managing director at JQ International, which is an LA based LGBTQ and Jewish nonprofit. Um, Arya is taking a time out from hiking uh, the park with his rainbow flag in tow. We're very grateful that he and Deborah have taken time out of their vacations to be with us. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Joy Layden, who is um, an author, a poet, and a professor, a chair actually in English at Stern College, uh, which is a part of Yeshiva University. She's also a member of the board of Keshet, um, which is maybe the leading Jewish organization on LGBTQ inclusion, I think, and was the first openly transgender employee of an Orthodox Jewish institution. Her um, memoir, uh, Through the Door of Life, A Jewish Journey Between Genders, came out in 2012. And she's also the author of a 2018 book called The Soul of the Stranger, Reading God and Torah from a Transgender Perspective. And we will put links to those books in the chat uh, when we can. I'm so thrilled to see people from Fort Lauderdale and Ta Toronto and Glasgow. And I think I saw Long Beach, which was where I lived right after college. So I'm thrilled to have you. And I want to start, you know, we have, we have, um, we've titled this 
where, how, you know, where we've been, sorry, how far we've come and what happens next. And I think I'm going to go to, I think our elder statesman, Arthur, to start us off. You know, we just had this big headline from the Supreme Court about, you know, just gay and le gay people, queer people and transgender people being covered by our, our employment laws. One of the ways we think we've come a long way, but give us your perspective after, you know, quarter century and activism and leadership in the Jewish LGBTQ space. How far have we come? Thanks, Jody. Good. So here it's morning here in San Francisco. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I just want to say what an honor it is to be on this panel with such distinguished uh, representatives and, and colleagues and leaders. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm quite humbled and proud to be here with all of you. So thanks for that. I will say, you know, here in San Francisco, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of our first Pride Parade. And that happened one year, the first Pride Parade happened one year after the Stonewall Riots in New York. And I was 14 years old in living in Brooklyn in 1969 when the Stonewall Riots took place. And um, I can remember the headlines. I can remember seeing the pictures in the newspaper, not only of the protesters, but of the men trying to hide their faces as they were being shoved into police vans. Uh, and just sort of a sense back then, I didn't have a word to describe who I was, but I had this sort of vague sense of unease that my life was somehow connected to these events. And there was, there was no one then at the time that was telling me that there was something in this story that I could take pride in that was connecting me to sort of a rich heritage, et cetera. And so, you know, so we just had our pride Seder at our synagogue where we, where we just sort of attempt to sort of, you know, tell the story of queer liberation, much as we tell the story of Jewish liberation and Passover. Um, so, um, you know, we've come, we have certainly made a lot of progress. You know, some pe I've just been elected to this position of the board chair. We don't say chairman, Jody, we say chair. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, of the Jewish Federation here in San Francisco, the Jewish Community Federation and Endowment Fund. And uh, I'm the first openly gay person to have this post, but um, at, at first I wasn't sure how much of a milestone to make of this. You know, I think if, if I look around the Bay Area, we have many, many queer rabbis in pulpits all over the Bay Area, some of the biggest synagogues, the most significant synagogues that we have. There are LGBT people in lay and staff positions at many Jewish organizations, including the Federation. So I guess I was initially a bit reluctant to talk about this as a milestone. It's, I think it's certainly not a jaw-dropping or earth-shattering thing, but I think over time I've, I've come to think of it a little bit differently. I think some of it is the reaction that I've gotten from so many queer Jews, both, both in San Francisco and around the country, who are taking great pride in my taking on this role. And perhaps it has to do with the symbol of the Federation, the perception that it's such a mainstream establishment part of Jewish life, an organization that's occupying a very central role in the community. And I think maybe it's also significant because of how my being gay fits into my overall identity. I'm not a Jewish leader who just happens to be gay. I, being gay is as much a defining part of who I am as being Jewish is. I come to this role as an activist, as someone who has spent the past decade creating and leading an organization dedicated to the struggle for LGBT equality, both here in North America and in Israel. So I think that's, I think that's maybe, maybe important. But I think, I think that for me, the most important thing at this moment is hit in history is not simply that I'm gay, but the fact that I bring an experience of knowing what it feels like to be an outsider in the Jewish world. I'm old enough to remember when I wasn't sure that there would ever be a place for me in the Jewish world. And I think today, so I think that gives me maybe a different kind of empathy with many, many people today who are wondering the same thing. Is, 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 yeah. there a, them? is our tent big enough to really embrace everyone who thinks of themselves as being part of the Jewish world? And I think that's the challenge that we face. And so uh, in that, I think for me, that's the most significant part of my taking on this role. Um, I love that. And thanks. You gave us a great opening because there's so many things to pick up on from there. I want to just first say, though, if you're in the audience and you want to, you're, I, I'm noticing that a lot of you have shared great things in the chat, but you're chatting only to all panelists, including 
Fran Friedman, who says, greetings from an 80-year-old prideful Bronx grandma of a trans boy, which I love. So if you want to share in the chat to everybody, you want to hit all panelists and attendees like Scott Chase just did. So that's where you want to post your comments and share personal details. Um, and if you want to just talk to the panelists, you can do that with all panelists. But again, questions go in the Q&A. Arthur, I want to talk, you ended by talking a little bit about this whole, the broader question of outsiders and ways that Jewish institutions need to open up. And, you know, the driving force of that conversation in recent weeks has really been around Jews of color. Um, and I guess I was, I wanted to ask all of you um, to talk a little bit about, I was going to ask it in the, in the context of, you know, this Pride Month has been a very different Pride Month. Um, first, obviously, because of the pandemic, but then I think also because of the way that the George Floyd protests and the quest for uh, racial justice and then the conversation in the Jewish world around Jews of color. I mean, I feel like it has kind of overtaken, you know, the American Jewish conversation happens to be during Pride Month and brings up, of course, a lot of issues around intersectionality that already were part of any kind of pride conversation. But I wonder if maybe each of each of the other three panelists could could talk a little bit about how this Pride Month has been different, uh, particularly on that question of kind of how to balance the different issues that the Jewish community is facing around different identity questions. Maybe we'll, for me, Arya's in the top left and then Deborah and then Joy. So maybe we'll go in that order. Sure, thanks so much, Jody. And I'm honored to be on this panel with everyone else that is so inspiring to me as a queer activist. Um, I actually, I must share that just a couple weeks ago, what would have been the Los Angeles LGBTQ Pride March um, was then, be then became the All Black Lives Matter March instead. And over 40,000 people showed up. And it was, for me personally, the most meaningful pride I have ever celebrated in my life. And I wouldn't know it until I experienced it, but it was the first time that a pride march felt like what a pride march is supposed to be, which is a fight for equality and justice. And the diversity of the audience in that, you know, 40,000 person march, and I know New York just had theirs on Sunday, it was, it just reverberated in every bone in my body that um, this is what pride is. And, and it's interesting, I mean, I have the flag here and um, not many people, I should say some people aren't familiar with the black and brown striped version of the pride flag. And that was created in Philadelphia first and made to honor the black and brown queer and trans women uh, on, whom, on whose backs much of the pride movement began. Um, people like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. So it's poignant, it's timely that um, as we're having this conversation about racial justice and black lives, that we identify and honor the reality, our history, that um, black and brown queer people were at the forefront of the entire liberation movement for queer rights. And so that is a, it's a really powerful opportunity, I think, for queer people to step in and step up. Um, and we would, I, I think we should have anyhow, but how much more so given our own movement for freedom is rooted in the activism of individuals that are now being fought for still, you know, over 50 years later. Um, that, that, was, that was beautiful, Arya. I, I, I want to echo my appreciation for being part of this really wonderful uh, group and also Jody for having the conversation. It feels really important. Um, I spoke at, I zoomed into a uh, Reconstructionist congregation uh, in Cold Street, ha Spring Harbor on, uh, for Pride on Juneteenth. So it just really um, crystallized in, in the clearest possible way, like the, the intersectionality of the event. And I mean, the framing thing that I said was that we have to understand I, I, that our liberations are really bound up in each other, that that's what, that's what intersectionality at, at its most powerful is, is recognizing that it, as, as Arthur said earlier, that what we want to do is be creating a Jewish community where everybody can feel like they come into the, the fullest possible expression of themselves. And that's a long-standing Reconstructionist commitment that from the earliest years when Mordecai Kaplan is started to formulate the, the, the principles of Reconstructionism, the goal always was to expand the boundaries of participation and lower, the, lower them without compromising standards so that as many people who wanted to affirmatively come in, what that has meant all along is that 
the Jewish community has to change. That balance between individual and community where we want to come to the fullest expressions of ourselves, and this is what I think real true inclusion means, is that it's not just come on in, but we are going to be transformed by this process. That when, we, when folks who have been pushed to the margins or even outside of them have a place in the community, that means that the community, that the collective changes in incredibly powerful ways. So for the Reconstructionist movement, the LGBT inclusion that allows someone uh, for like me, an out lesbian to rise up to the highest levels of leadership, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a culmination of, of, of a commitment to democracy and inclusion from the earliest years that started with um, bringing women to the fullness of, 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 of Jewish communal and religious life um, in, in contradistinction to halachic norms. Uh, and, and then and also paying attention to folks who are partnered with non-Jews and understanding that the decision to marry someone who wasn't Jewish was not co-equal with the decision to exit the Jewish community. And so the, I think the LGBT piece, it was, it was the next iteration of that just as a different understanding of Jews of color is now the work that we have to do. And it's continually unfolding and it's gotta be with a stance of curiosity and humility um, and excitement about that change, the changes that are going to come out of this richer and more diverse community. I am so glad, uh, Rabbi, that you use the word inclusion, and I think it's important in terms of um, both uh, Jews of color and LGBTQ people in the Jewish community to recognize that there's a spectrum from basically genocide let's kill everybody who's different the way you're different, to tolerance, which is sort of over the midpoint, to full inclusion, which is saying, hey, you're family, so your needs are our needs. We wanna know about you, we wanna be changed by you because you are us. And in my experience as um, a lot of my work uh, has been to go to um, Jewish communities and institutions around the country, and uh, they don't invite me unless they want to do something toward inclusion. And I have to say, we, what I, I think we have made a start. We've made a real start. I think that there are very few, relatively few, Jewish communities that would opt for anything, um, uh, you know, like harassing LGBTQ people out of the, the communities, even uh, many Orthodox communities have uh, changed in those kinds of ways. However, there are very few Jewish communities that I've seen that have really gone much far beyond welcoming, which is like, sure, come if you want to, or tolerance, which is, okay, you're here. Let's not make a big fuss about it. You know, our work is done. We're letting you be here with us. And all the way to inclusion. I don't, I don't feel that we've gotten there very much. Just last year, I went to a very uh, liberal and progressive um, synagogue that was celebrating its first pride. And this year, I went to another very liberal <laughs> synagogue that was celebrating its first pride. In terms of this year's um, uh, public reckoning with racism and racial justice, I have this kind of double consciousness because as a trans person, I'm acutely aware of having uh, now lived through years where my rights and standing as a human being have been um, they've been forcibly attacked. And as a white person, I have, from the moment I started uh, living as an out trans person, I have been protected. I've been safer. Um, I've had less to worry about. I still get worried when I interact with police as a trans person, but I have had so much less to worry about. And so as a white person, I have to uh, really go through this reckoning. And as a trans person, I need to use my awareness of the kinds of vulnerability that we often, you know, they get masked by uh, abstractions like marginalization or oppression. What it really means to uh, not feel like you're safe when you walk down the street or to worry about being um, verbally or physically assaulted when you walk into a store or a restaurant. That is an experience that uh, trans people and people of color and queer people of color um, all share in different degrees. And I just, the last thing I want to say is I've probably uh, done, probably done over a hundred events uh, 
over the past few years in Jewish communities around LGBTQ stuff. And though audiences have been almost all white in almost every case. So um, that tells me that um, we have, uh, we're saying more of the right things, but I'm not sure how much of the work of actually getting these missing parts of our family in there we're doing. Yeah. Go ahead, Rabbi Waxman. Oh, you're on mute still. Got it. Um, it's so it's so important to 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 bring that to speech. Um, and the the flip side of it is, I do want to share that part of reconstructing Judaism is also the reconstructionist rabbinical college, the reconstruction seminary, and. From the moment that we began to admit openly, at that time it was mostly gay and lesbian students, but in the, in the, in the mid 1980s to this moment, and I would say in some ways my elevation has uh, reinforced it, we have been known as the gay seminary. Um, and we have students of color, we have many trans students, we have many trans students of color, and I worry and I wonder and I question at all times and this comes up a lot in my leadership like on the one hand I'm so proud of being on that cutting edge and transforming and I was so moved when a uh, queer student of color said this is the only seminary I looked at because I felt at home as soon as I walked in through the doors it felt like family as I love that metaphor that you used felt like family so I'm so proud of, we're not perfect. We have lots of work to do. We're constantly doing trainings, but the space that we're able to occupy and that same space also leads to our being marginalized and dismissed and not taken seriously. Um, and so that tension of both, you know, what it, what it means, what the edge means, both in how it can cut through and how it can, you can fall off and to how, to, how, to, how, to, how to enact the transformation beyond tokenization. Yeah, so Arthur, I know you want to jump in and I just want to, you should say whatever you were going to say, but I want to focus all of us and I would love to just pick up on what Dr. Layden is sort of asking, which is like, how do we, what, what strategies have you actually seen institutions, whether it's a synagogue or another kind of Jewish organization do that has actually made people, made it seem not like, oh, you're welcome, you know, please come and speak to us or with, they have gone from welcoming to true inclusion. So as concrete as we can be would be great, but let's start wherever you were gonna start, Arthur, and then you can move towards that. Sure, I was, I was gonna say, you know, my husband of 25 years is an Asian man. And, and from the moment that we met, he began to come to synagogue with me and, and, and then slowly began to think about whether he wanted to convert to Judaism. And one of the things he told me was, one of the barriers was he said to me, when I come to Shahar Zahav, I'm all, I always feel welcome. He said, but everybody there looks like you. We are this community of white Ashkenazi Jews mostly. And, we, and I, think, I think that is sort of the challenge that we have. How do we do some self-reflection to understand how consciously, or maybe even more, more the case unconsciously, we have created white spaces. That even, even among them, even where, the, even among the most progressive queer, Jewish spaces we have, they look mostly white. And, and how we, how we what well, the kind of reflection that we need to do to think about that and how, and how we are open to the kinds of transformation that uh, Rabbi Waxman was talking about is I think really significant. There's, there's, there's lots of listening and reflection and uh, internal introspection that we need to do, I think, to, to really come to groups with that. Yeah, and I just, I'll just add that how my husband finally got to converting was that we went to Israel. And in Israel, he saw the Moroccan Jews and the Iranian Jews and the Ethiopian Jews. And he said to me, he said, and he actually used, he used to me, I think this mishpacha might be big enough to include me. He used the word mishpacha because he loves Yiddish. But, um, but anyway. It's a great transition to bring us to Arya, who of course grew up in a Sephardic or Mizrahi mm -hmm. community. Um, I'd love you to talk about, um, you know, and you've also chosen to really focus your activism, your queer activism in that community, right? Um, which is maybe not the easiest way to be a queer activist in the Jewish world, I think. But anyway, what, tell, jump, jump in. Thank you. I, you know, we would be remiss not to bring up the topic of Ashkenormativity in this conversation, especially in this current political climate. Um, the, for anyone who's unfamiliar, Ashkenormativity is this 
that it's either the systemic, communal, or even individual assertion of Ashkenazi Judaism as the norm. And it informs how organizations build their communities and what things they do um, from a structural level, from an organizational cultural level and onward to you know, communicate that. And for me, um, I grew up as a very cultural Jew. And, and I say that because my Persian identity is inseparable from, my, inseparable from my Judaism. I've always said I am a Persian Jew. I'm never just Persian and I'm never Jew just Jewish. And, and Shabbat was really our Torah. So I didn't have much of a more rich religious Jewish identity. But in college, I found Hillel. And the only reason I have to admit, and I do credit Hillel with this, the reason why I leaned in to exploring more about my Judaism was because Hillel had decided at that point that we're going to empower a group of students to essentially cultivate the type of Jewish life on campus that they're not seeing and that they would like to see and we'll fund it and we'll let them sort of explore that arena. And as a result, I've been working for the nonprofit Jewish community for 12 years. Um, and so I, I, I bring up the Ashkenormativity piece because for so many of us that are non-white, um, we find that all the institutions that we inhabit, be that the Shabbat tunes and hymns or the food served or otherwise, is essentially strictly in this Ashkenazi lane. And I think when we talk about what you asked previously about full inclusion, what does the breadth of inclusion look like, that this that it's an imperative, honestly, that Jewish organizations, institutions, and communities think about the embrace of minorities and diversities as, as integral to our survival, even. I mean, it's integral to our relevance, that is, as we consider the way that youth are going up today and how their intersecting identities want to be embraced in all spaces they inhabit, rather than, well, I'll go, to Ju I'll go to synagogue for my Judaism, and I'll go to the gay bar for my queerness, and I'll go to here for my racial justice. And I, that's not the way that we hear 16-year-olds talk about identity, and thus, not only because it's our responsibility to embrace people in their wholeness, um, but also because it's a, it's a Jewish concept, this piece about uplifting the human dignity of a person and ensuring that they feel completely whole in the spaces that we create. And just a bit more about that question you asked about how can these institutions think about inclusion more deeply. I know Joy can speak to this deeply as well as a board member of Keshet, but our organizations, JQ and Keshet, work to do, you know, initially we used to call them inclusion trainings, and now we're calling them inclusion consultations. Because on the front end of this work, I think synagogues and day schools and Jewish camps have decided, yes, we'd like to learn more about queerness and how to embrace queerness thought that a two hour training was sufficient. And we know for a fact that when we're talking about, again, changing systems and structures, that we're talking about a consultation of minimum three months, we'd hope over 12. And the ones that have done it well, I'd say briefly, you know, they think about how they onboard their teams, how they train their teams, what are their values and principles at their organizations and institutions, and how openly do they communicate the full embrace of LGBTQ people. And, and beyond even the welcoming and inclusion piece, the embrace piece leans into, if there are queer people in our midst, we actually want to spotlight them because they have something unique and special to offer our synagogue or our space. So we, we do training with them. And I, I just say that from where JQ began in 2004 to now at 2020, the fact that we're scurrying to get to the next training rather than like, banging on people's doors to be let in to even have this conversation, says something good about our work and let's just pray and do the work to, to ensure that this work is not focused in June from June 1st through June 30th. That Pride Month isn't the time that we have these conversations, but January 1 through December 31st is a time to talk about all levels of inclusion. Yeah, there was someone in the chat, I don't think it went to everybody, but pointed out that, suggested that we even move from the word inclusion to the word belonging and made the point, I think, riffing off of something that Rabbi Waxman had said that um, the, that reframing is sort of like not just a seat at the table, but a whole new table. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting metaphor. Dr. Leiden, I want to go to you and ask you, I, I think there's something you've written about, but like, you know, so you have you speak all over the Jewish community. You said you've spoken to you know, 100 places in the last few years. 
And, but you work in a particular place. You've chosen to stay in a particular part of the Jewish community that I would say is, you know, rather on the conservative end and perhaps has a particular set of um, struggles with LGBTQ issues that maybe are more rooted in Torah and Halacha. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it is like to be, I think you said, the first openly trans person in an Orthodox Jewish institution. Um, and kind of really why, why you've chosen to build your career and keep your home base in the Orthodox world. Hope you're on mute still. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry, thank you. Um, I am happy to talk about that. I just also wanted to thank um, Aria and uh, Deborah and Arthur for the important things that they were saying and to, um, Ari, you were talking about working with organizations for three to six months. Deborah, you added in the chat, this is a three to five year process. What, uh, what I would say, you know, Keshet is also, there are many organizations that want to work with us. I would say, number one, this is a community by community process. It's one of the reasons that um, changes at the top don't actually change things for most people in most places. It's just not the way change works. It's also not the way change works in the Orthodox world, as I've come to learn. There has been a lot of change at the grassroots level in Orthodox communities, particularly um, families uh, insisting that their gay and lesbian children are their children, and you know, some kind of place has to be made for them. Um, and, and there's still a long way to go before Orthodox rabbis in general are willing to um, affirm that halacha has changed in different kinds of important ways. But I think that it's easy for a lot of other Jewish movements to say, well, you know, we're better than the Orthodox. But what I've, what I've found is that the struggles that Orthodox communities have are pretty similar to the struggles of all the communities, Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and non-religious, that I'm familiar with, that, um, uh, communities are based on giving people a sense of belonging, that great word, that sense of being part of us. And often that sense of being part of us is created by uh, pushing away people who don't easily fit into the sense of who us is, denying that they're there completely, um, tolerating without commenting on. And that's really where my, uh, my university is with me, right? They decided for reasons that are really known only to them, that they were going to let me come back and teach, and they have. And I have never been harassed or abused or um, treated disrespectfully by students. I don't have a lot of students anymore. I used to have a lot of students. Um, can you, can you, what, what happened? What changed? I changed. When I came back as myself, uh, it became hard for students to work with me. And a few students have been able to talk. I'm sorry, De what were you going to say, Deborah? I, no, I mean, I, I, I was going to... Like, please keep going. I, 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 so I, I, the, 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 it's the gestalt. It's the, it's the whole. And, it's, it, and it's, so it's... It, you change. That's so powerful. I, I was... But can, but can you quantify for us, because for those who don't know your story as closely, like, what was it before? What is it now? How... how so when I was teaching there as a man, I was a very popular teacher. The last semester that I taught as a man, I was nominated for teacher of the year, which is particularly striking because I gave really terrible grades. I was very <laughs> demanding. What, was your, and, what were you teaching? What was your subject matter? Um, various forms of writing and American literature. And I have a very high, uh, regard for my students, but also just for human beings. And I know that a lot of my students come through school systems that don't take them that seriously. Not all of them. Some of them come from excellent schools, but some of them come from schools where like, you know, you're a girl. This is a girl's education. You're going to get married. You're going to have children. And I was not going to treat them like that. I remember one student broke down in gratitude when I gave her a D. She said, you're the first person who has taken my ideas seriously in my life. Wow. And it was very moving for me. So to 
uh, be a popular teacher giving low grades in a, uh, you know, a grade obsessed culture where every family considers it a failure if their students get less than an A was really something. When I came back, um, I would say enrollment in my classes was halved at best. Same, and same topics, same subject matters. Same subject matter. And um, I've had classes that didn't enroll at all. Again, standard classes. I no longer teach unusual or demanding subjects. I teach the most basic classes. I inflate my grades. I still try to um, engage students in ways that make it clear that I take their ideas seriously but I want to lower the bars as much as I can. I never talk. When I was there teaching as, um, as a man that I wasn't, I would often talk about my personal life because I wanted students to realize that studying literature and writing, we bring our whole lives to it and our life experiences. And I wanted to model that. When I came back as myself, I expected I'd do the same thing. And then I walked into the classroom and I realized, oh, I'm never going to talk about my life anymore because I don't know what my students know. I don't want to lose anybody. I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable or like they can't study literature with me because they're not prepared to talk about trans identity. That's not central to my, my teaching. So I, in other words, participated in the don't ask, don't tell culture, which is what tolerance looks like. When we say teach tolerance, well, we should change all of those bumper stickers to teach, don't ask, don't tell. Pretend that people who are different in our communities, there aren't many of them, that their differences don't matter. There's nothing to talk about, nothing to see here, folks. No change that our communities need to make to recognize who's part of the family. No need to challenge Ashkenormativity or heteronormativity. No need to ask what we are losing by not hearing from the, the experiences and the voices and the needs of the people who don't fit whatever the norms of a given community are. So my university has lost out on that on the one hand, but on the other hand, just my being there, really nothing I've done, just my being there, has I think become a, a basis on which a, I've heard from a lot of LGBTQ Orthodox Jews that was a marker of hope. And there has been a lot of movement, you know, I'm not doing that work. A lot of uh, queer Orthodox Jews are doing that work. But I think that my ability to hang in there has been a thing of value for them. I'll come on that. Um, Rabbi Waxman. So, uh, thank you so much for sharing. And I think to go back to something that you said at the beginning, Joy, about um, uh, liberal movements su su suggesting were better. I don't think it's that. I mean, I hope it's not that. I hope that there's not triumphalism, at least from the Reconstructionist movement. What I would say is there's this calculation um, uh, of where and how do we want to exert ourselves and our energy. And I, you know, I grew up in the conservative movement, which is it considers itself a halachic movement. And when it came, when I wanted to come to, decided to go to rabbinical school, I was in the process of questioning my sexuality. And I only applied to RRC. Um, I hadn't fully come out yet. I could have gone to the conservative seminary and stayed in the closet. And I think I, I, think I understood, I, I was able to bring to speech then that RRC would help me be the best possible human being and that would help me be the best possible rabbi. And I didn't yet have the words or the courage or the clarity to say part of that meant that I wanted to build my life with, a, with another woman. Um, and, um, and I think that what I find liberating about being in a post-halachic movement, where we take halacha very, very seriously, and we're not bound by it. So it is one incredibly important and cherished voice in a, in a, in a rich conversation about what does identity and community and sexuality mean at this moment in time, it just means that so much more time and so much more energy is liberated to have these very proactive conversations, both building ourselves and building up our communities rather than the more um, defensive stance that I think it, that, 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 that you, I think it's so brave and it's so important and I'm 100% certain that you are changing lives in the work that you are doing. And, and that um, hopefully all of it 
together. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, working in different places is going to create a different reality for the next generation. So I'm going to jump in here. I want to change directions a little bit. We have a bunch of questions that I'm going to ask from attendees. And just another note, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. But I want to ask you, Rabbi Waxman, about something that you brought up to me as we were preparing for this talk, which was that back in 2013, when you were appointed to lead uh, Reconstructionism, Reconstruction Judaism, um, the headline in the forward article, which I was not the editor then, I was off being criticized for other things as Jerusalem Bureau Chief of the New York Times, but the headline was something like trailblazing lesbian to take the leadership of this group. And you said in your note to me that um, there was immediate outrage. I think you said among a lot of straight supporters of yours who were totally offended by this tokenization. And there was a push to uh, try to get the forward to change the headline, which I guess they didn't for a while, but somebody has changed it <laughs> because when you were looking up the story, you found it had a new headline. And this related to what Arthur was talking about at the very beginning of our talk about um, how much he, as he takes on this new role as chair in the Federation, you know, how big a deal is it and how, how out front should it be that it's, um, you know, a gay leader. And I guess I'd love you to share a little bit of your feelings about this. I mean, on the one hand, like noting that you were the first openly gay person to lead a major Jewish denomination seems like a newsworthy thing. Um, I didn't write the headline or change it or anything. I had nothing to do with it. But I can understand why, why somebody would want to really point readers to, hey, this is part of the big deal here. And I can also understand why you might feel tokenized and like that was deminimizing you. So if you could talk about it a little bit and then I bet other people have things to say. So we'll go to Arya because we've been neglecting him and then see where we go with that. And then, but let's everybody keep it short because we have about 15 minutes and a bunch of questions in the, from the audience. So go ahead, Rabbi Watson put his finger on it in his introductory remarks about like what, what it means the fact that he was raised up to the position that he currently occupies as a as a gay activist like and how important that is I, I mean i think that there was just a broad range of opinion i i did i did expect the headline you know like i'm also a rabbi i'm also a phd at Purim they sometimes they they tease me in spiels and they introduce introduce me as like rabbi doctor President lesbian Waxman, you know that was that was the poem the, the following year. Um, I called my mother when the headline came out and said, "Well, the forward story is out," and they and I read her that, that the headline and she said, "Well, of course it's a hook. It is newsworthy," but it was that many straight folks came up to me for two to three years afterwards and said they would never have said Reconstruction is a point trailblazing heterosexual man. Um, so it's just it's just that it's like when is it newsworthy? But gay people didn't say that to you, queer people. Uh, you know, queer people said to me, I am worried that it's tokenizing. I am worried that it will just, let me tell you the comments. I got condolence notes from people about how brutal the comments were. And I, what I said back to them was, I don't read the comments, but the that. attack that came because of the headline was, uh, I mean, I, they shut the comment section down because it was so much of an attack, mostly from Orthodox Jews saying, how dare you, how dare you call yourself a Jew? How dare, but that also did, the fact that I was a woman, you know, the, we're gender, we're halakha, when the norm is heterosexual cisgender masculinity, then, you know, I'm an outlier in so many ways. And so, um, so it's just, it's just that question is when is it normal like when is it like Tim Cook it's just one part of my personality when is it like what Arthur said I rose to leadership because I'm a queer activist like when, when you know when is it what and some of it's the and, and, and Joy was talking about the zeitgeist like the whole gestalt like when is that transformative and when is that suppressive or or, or oppressive and it's just um you just never know I mean that one of the things that I suspect we will all share is it's just a lot of vigilance and there's just a lot of questioning. Who's an ally? Who's advancing? Right. Who's I mean, neutral? Who's, who's, who's punitive? Yeah. I mean, look, I would say as a journalist, like, first of all, headlines are really hard. They're really short. Um, but yeah, the, the guidance I would give now is really how relevant is it to this person? So if it's incidental, then you don't put it in the headline. And if it's core, then you might. But Arya, how does that look to you? Does this look like a kind of old fashioned old people's argument? Or is this kind of still relevant in your generation? No, I find it quite relevant. I actually want to lean in, if it's okay, to, to one of the last things Deborah said about 
allyship, about just the, the need for allies and how we think about that. You know, I've, we've, we've begun to say recently, or mark the difference, I should say, between individuals who support LGBTQ equality and believe in uh, the sanctity of our lives and at a core level internally understand that we are equal and we would call those people supporters and we love supporters and we need our supporters. And then there are allies who believe all the same things that a supporter would, but also act measurably to affect our equality. And when there is a trans military ban, they're the first to be out there to say, this is unjust. I am an ally of the LGBTQ community, this can't be. And I think when we talk about the Jewish community on the whole right now, and as it relates to sort of where we've come and where we're going, we do have a decent amount of support. And there is a lot of lip service um, that suggests that the institutions that we're a part of believe in our equality and love us the same. But that's different from seeing those same institutions or organizations take measurable action. That, and, and Deborah, you're absolutely right. When I mentioned that sort of three, six, nine, or 12 months, it's like the opening conversation to um, helping to embed inclusion as an organizational practice. Um, for those that have, for those that have, we have worked with for several years now, the outcomes are incredible. Certainly there is that one or two detractor sets of parents that just can't believe that the institution decided to do this thing. And why didn't they get the parents permission to even start talking about equality, not even to the kids, but as clergy or as leaders, um, to which I heard one rabbi respond, it's not only our, um, we, don't, we not only have the right to have this conversation, it's our responsibility to have this conversation as Jewish educators, which I thought was incredible. Um, and this is sort of out of left field, but I want to squeeze it in before 1130. Uh, it's really important to mention, I think others have asked about asking us to speak about the Torah prohibition. And I think others on this call are more better positioned to do that. Um, but I just want to communicate that when we think about queer life and we recognize that every major psychological, psychiatric, pediatric institution, organization has named that it is an organic part of human existence. And also, of course, you know, took back the, uh, the having called homosexuality disease and trying to treat it, and now recognizing that conversion therapy is one of the most harmful possible uh, experiences that especially youth might go through, but even adults. We have a responsibility to ensure that, in particular, I really want to just focus on our youth for this moment, our youth are not feeling repressed to the degree that a statistic such as 40% of LGBTQ youth considered suicide in 2019 of those, uh, of those surveyed, that's, that's, an, that's horrendous. Or that two or three of those same uh, LGBTQ youth uh, had heard from someone in their lives that they should consider or try changing. And these are all from the Trevor Project in a 2019 survey that can be looked up data-wise. But I just want to exaggerate the point that if you're on this call, you likely are a supporter or an ally, or maybe you came here to just hear some opinions and expand a bit on your own knowledge. I would hope that everyone walks away with a personal sense that wherever I lack knowledge, I will seek it proactively rather than reactively when this conversation comes to me. And as it relates to the Jewish community, I hope to cultivate for the future that all levels of diversity, be that Jews of color, Jews of differing abilities, Sephardic Mizrahi, Jew Judaism, that that diversity matters for our, for our entire Jewish communal sector and Jewish world. Thank you. Um, excellent. There are two, two kind of strains in the chat, that, in the Q&A that I want to pick up on. Um, the first um, is about the issue of Zionism and how the Israel-Palestine question kind of connects up with LGBTQ activism. And I think, Arthur, this is something that you've dealt with quite a lot through a wider bridge. Um, I think you referred to yourself in a note earlier as an out Zionist as well, right? And um, there's been a lot of conversation around this also with the Black Lives Matter movement uh, over the years. And, and what, you know, we, we've written some interesting things about whether and how to connect somebody's your own Zionism or, or feelings about Israel with your feelings about Black Lives Matter and racial justice. I, I just wonder, Arthur, why don't you start us off, but maybe people uh, just, again, quickly, some comments on how to, whether this is coming up as a tension in, in um, 
somebody mentioned dyke marches, which at uh, 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 places where Palestinians are venerated or support for Palestinians is important and criticism of Israel. So I wonder if you guys could just talk about your own experiences in kind of melding your Israel connections or activism and your LBG, LGBTQ activism. Sure. So I guess I'll start, I, I'll say I'm a, I'm a progressive Jewish queer Zionist, and that's a lot of identities to integrate into, a lot of labels to integrate into one identity. Are you a vegan? No. <laughs> no, I'm an ally of vegans. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, I, and I'm also, I guess I'm a strong believer in the idea of Kalal Yisrael, that we are all connected, we are all at Sinai, that, that Judaism is more than just a religion, we are a culture, we are a people. Uh, and so, and so for me, that means as a, when we're talking about our lives as LGBTQ Jews, you know, roughly speaking, there are two big populations of Jews in the world, one in North America and one in Israel, about, of, of about the same size. So that really means that, you know, about half of the gay Jews in the world are sitting in Israel. And so, you know, some, I started a wider bridge because I, I wanted to, to have some community with them. And I also felt it was really important to understand how in a, in a country where Jews are in charge, how is it that the LGBT community is being treated? What is their struggle? And how can we, even from afar, learn from them, join with them, struggle with them in, in the quest to make the, the Jewish homeland a better place for queer people? Um, and you know, what I ran into was, I think from both sides, the, this sort of rigidity polarization of the conversation, you know, on the, on the one hand, some people saying that, you know, if you are truly a progressive, the intersectionality agenda demands sort of, you know, firm support for the Palestinian community and a condemnation of Zionism and Israel, and that really no, you know, you just, no one would, there was no, it was no interest in having a conversation that was just about what is the LGBT struggle inside of Israel like. And on the other hand, there were voices who were saying, well, you know, you sort of what I would call the actual true pink washing, kind of being able to say, you know, Israel is a, is a relatively good place for LGBT people. And so, you know, that's why we should love Israel. That's why we should defend Israel. Uh, that kind of a, a, a very sort of a simplification of, of the conversation. And there wasn't much room for this, for a more nuanced conversation in the middle. Uh, and I think, I think we are still suffering from that, from this kind of this rigidity and polarization in our community and, and um, you know, and it really an inability to sort of grapple deeply, um, you know, with the connection between, between the Jewish communities in North America and Israel. I will say that there's something so enriching. You know, one of the things, you know, about Israel is a very siloed community, very siloed country. People live in, you know, it's the, the, the ultra-Orthodox and the settlers and the Arabs and the Ashkenazi in Tel Aviv. Um, but when you go there as an LGBT person, that can be, that can really is a window into all of the world of Israel. And be, because I'm queer, I somehow now have friends in Israel who are Ethiopian, who are Orthodox, who are transgender, uh, you know, who are Arab, uh, and it's sort of this, this it, is, it has really enriched my understanding of what it means to be a Zionist, of what it means to be Jewish, of what it means to be queer, actually. Uh, and so that's been, that's been uh, and, I, and I think that's sort of the beauty that a lot of people appreciate when they, when they actually set foot in Israel and they see kind of the, the reality of the, of the queer struggle there. But it is challenging. But and as with so many things, the issue is often not how it is in Israel, but how it is in the activism around Israel and the diaspora, right? So what have others of you experienced? Are you experiencing tension in kind of L LGBTQ activism with Zionism or with as the questioner asked, with uh, support for Palestinians and how, how, how those things intersect? Or is there, is there a tension and a challenge or is this not an issue? Well, I would say it's an issue for sure. I, I think I have had many people say to me that it is much easier to be an LGBT person in a Jewish space than it is to be a Zionist in a queer space. That, 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 that tension is for sure out there. And, you know, you know much like, you know, um, you know, 
many progressive Jews will say, we don't want to have to check our progressive values at the door and when we come into a discussion about Israel. Yeah. Others will say, we don't want to have to check our Zionism at the door when we come into a progressive space. I think, I think that's really interesting what you said, Arthur, because I'm just thinking about the parallel here with Jews of color. And I think I've definitely heard half of what you said in that context, right? Which is that it's hard to be a Zionist in a Black Lives Matter space or in a Women's March space and other kind of progressive spaces. But you don't hear the opposite, right? Which is that it's easier to be a Jew of color in the Jewish space. So I think that's, that's maybe the difference of how much work there is to be done. I'm gonna change topics quickly to this question that you also brought up in the beginning, um, although I might let you have the last word on this one, which is, because Ruben Louie is asking, are LGBTQ congregations still needed as much today as when started 40 plus years ago? And he's saying, I miss Or, or Hadass Chicago as I knew it until a few years ago. So I don't know, I know Arthur obviously has been a core member of such a congregation. Maybe Rabbi Waxman will start and then if Joy and Arya have experience, you can jump in. If not, we'll go back to Arthur. The story of our congregation in Atlanta, Georgia, which was founded, it's called Congregation Beit Chaverim, and it was founded as a, uh, I think at the time they probably said gay and lesbian synagogue back in the uh, early, late 80s, like uh, maybe early 80s, like at the very, very beginning of LGBT synagogues, which got, got you know, and, um, and so it was for a long time the queer synagogue in Atlanta. But and because it was also a reconstruction stipulated and, and put forward a very progressive vision, it became a destination synagogue for progressive Jews from around the greater metropolitan Atlanta area. And as it grew, at a certain point, the membership tipped so that it was more uh, straight than queer. And so they have remade themselves where they talk about themselves as they, they honor their LGBT heritage incredibly seriously. They have a prayer for hiding that is both for being in the closet, both for queer Jews, queer people, but they have done the imagining of what it means for other, for other constituencies and what it's like to, to come out and be embraced fully. And so, you know, that, that there's and and yet they they do not want to give up on that that heritage. So I think that, you know, you see, we have the example of CBST, which is unaffiliated flourishing or Shahar Zahav, and we have the example of this congregation that hasn't gone out of existence, but has transformed in a way that honors the heritage, continues to work on the core issue as allies, um, and, and also is, is, is evolving in really powerful ways. So um, I, I, think, um, I think evolution is really, really important as part, in part of this, this part of this configuration. I realize we are really short on time. So Arthur, a very quick answer on whether you think these congregations should still exist, and then we'll go Back to Arya and Joy for my last question. So go ahead. Sure. So I think there's a there's like a both and here to the answer to this question. I mean, I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the fact that in 1977, three Jewish gay men decided to create a synagogue in San Francisco. And for so many years, these were the only places that we could really find acceptance, welcoming, celebration, etc. Uh, and that's changing. And that's changing. And that's a good thing that it's changing. It's you know. LGBT people used to drive for two hours to come to Shahar Zahav, mm. and today they can find communities closer to their home where they feel welcomed enough that they don't need to commute for two hours, and that's and that's a beautiful thing. But there's something I, I will say too. I, I think the welcoming is of degrees. I think if you are a a couple of two white cisgender professional men. Uh, who you are, you will find welcoming in almost any congregation in the in the Bay Area. Let's say maybe even around the country. And the more you deviate from that model, if maybe if you're not Jewish or if you're not if, if one or both of you aren't white or if you are trans uh, or if you are unemployed uh, or disabled, you might the, the the degree of welcoming might be much less. And so there is still there is still something about there being a home for people who can who are, who feel marginalized, who can come together and know that they will find their identities truly embraced and welcomed and celebrated. But also there's something about the way in which Judaism gets reimagined inside of these institutions. You know, the, the sidurs that are created by the different LGBT congregations, the way that we truly are reimagining Jewish life that doesn't happen when you're just, even if you are welcomed, when you are just a small percentage of the community, uh, it's a different kind of experience. You know, I had we bring like these groups of Israelis to come to the Bay Area and they come, they, they, they tour the Bay Area and they see how open and welcoming they are. And then they come to Shahar Zahav and they say to us, 
you know, we've just been, we've been to all of these places that are so queer friendly. Why do you guys need your own synagogue? And I look at them and I say, well, why do you need your own country? And, yeah, and, and I say that with great love for Israel, but I think, I think that in fact, both are important. I think it's, it's wonderful that Jews are, are accepted in many parts of the world, but also I think it's a different experience to have a place where we get to build the table and make the rules and see what it's like when, when, you know, when, when queer people are actually in charge. Why do Jews need their own news organization so that we can have uh, conversations like this? Um, we are at time, but I am going to have, if, if everyone can stay, I do have one more question I want to ask, and I just want to thank everybody for being here. Thank all of our wonderful participants and chatters. I remind you that you will be getting in your email the video of this conversation, the chat, and a subscription offer to The Forward. I want to thank again Lisa Lepson, Dina Cooperman, Gabby Brooks, and all of your panelists for making this conversation happen. Happy Pride Month, happy last day of Pride to everybody here. I want to ask each of you, and we'll start with Dr. Layden, go to Arye, back to Arthur, and then give Rabbi Waxman the last word. I want to ask everyone, when we talk about what, what happens next, I want to think about a year from now, when I hope the four of you will join me again for another Zoom 